If you would, let's be opening our Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. Let's go with that one instead. Nehemiah chapter 13. We'll be looking at that here shortly. Before we get into the lesson this morning, I wanted to take a moment um, to explain the elders' uh, position where we currently are at on the Bible class situation. Because we've had some ask about Bible classes. And we have ran through different scenarios uh, in trying to work a way that we could actually have some measure of Bible classes like we used to have. Ultimately, our decision is to hold off a little longer before we try. The reason is most of our Bible class rooms are relatively small by comparison. And one option would to bring all the middle school and above kids out here for the Bible class and maybe use one of our larger rooms. But, and we also have, we have members on different sides of the spectrum. Although school has, got, has started back, um, we recognize that not everybody sees the threat the same way. And so to have Bible classes, we've got to find teachers who are willing to teach in a closed space and members who would be willing to bring their kids to the closed space with masks. Yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of challenging variables. So we've decided what the best thing to do is to, so as not to burden the congregation with trying to work through the varying viewpoints on this and the challenges that we'll face, that we will rely upon you as parents to continue teaching your children until we get past this virus or until it's deemed nest or safe to go back to closed spaces like we have. So if you're wondering about that, and you know, I'm one of the ones, I'm like, you know, let's, let's make it work, do the best we can, but that doesn't take everybody into consideration. And so we're trying to do that. And so you're, and I've, you've, said, you've heard me say this before. If the Bible class is the only time your children hear us about the Word of God, we need to do away with them anyway. Because your responsibility and my responsibility is to my own kids and you are to your children at home. And we trust that that's what you've been doing. I say trust in a very true fashion. We really believe that you've been working with your children. And eventually, we'll have Bible classes back up and go back to the normal way that we've been doing things. So if you've wondered why we started Bible classes back, ultimately, it's to, um, what's the term, abundance of caution. We're trying our best to be safe and to uh, make it so that it is not an uh, extra burden on members to have to worry with. So just kind of file that away, and hopefully that's a good answer. And um, like I said, I firmly believe we'll be, we'll be past this before long. You know, I've got the faith, we've got a virus, on, not a virus, we've got a vaccine on the way. I'd say by the middle of the next year, we're going to be looking back on this time period and thinking, boy, we're glad that that's behind us now. But I'm an optimist, so. All right, so Numbers chapter 13. Here's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the language of your people. The language of your people. We live in a country, in a world, where there are hundreds of languages, maybe even thousands of languages, I don't know. But typically, the way that the normal process works, you are raised in one country. Let's take America. And so you learn to speak the English language. But what if you lived in a situation where you decided to um, travel overseas to another country, and after a period of time, you forgot how to speak English? And not just how to speak English but you forgot the very cultures and the very things that makes up the cultures of our country. Now, we would say to ourselves, well, that would never happen. You know, once you learn how to speak English, you always know how to speak English. Once you learn how to speak German, et cetera, et cetera. But in Numbers chapter 13, there was a reason why God forbid his people from intermarrying with people from other nations. Now, keep in mind, there's a specific reason for it. Um, it wasn't uh, absolutely forbidden because Ruth married into the, the lineage that would bring about Christ. Rahab married into the lineage that would bring about Christ as well. So we know there were cases where you could marry someone from another land. The problem that we got into, or that they got into, 
is the level of influence of the individual on the life of the Israelites. And that's what we're going to look at here. Let's first turn over, if you're already there, Numbers chapter 13. Oh, I hope that's the second and only time I do that. Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 23 through 27. There's a reason why I very seldom use Noah and Moses in the same sermon. I get them mixed up too. But let's notice here in Nehemiah chapter 13. Pay close attention, beginning of verse 23. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So I contended with them and cursed them and struck them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons as yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Then verse 27, Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? You know, really the key word here is the idea of pagan women women. When he talks about foreign women here, it's pagan women. And you know, sometimes men are very interesting individuals. Sometimes a man's personality is such that he can meet and fall in love, and the woman kind of adapts to him. But then there are some times you've got a man who will marry a woman, and he ends up adapting to her. And what I mean by that is, you know what I mean, depending on the type of personality was, when you dated in high school, did you find that your, your style of music you preferred changed based on who you were going out with? Minor example, but it kind of happens that way. So what was going on here is many people of Judah were falling under the influence of foreign women, the pagan women. Okay, and that's what was going on here. So much so, like Solomon, they began to worship idols. They began to engage in the practices, the immoral practices and ungodly practices of these foreign nations. So much so that even their children had forgot the language of Judah. Think about that for just a moment. Their children had forgotten the language of Judah. This is how great their conversion was. This is how great their conversion to this other way of thinking and this, this, this other way of living and this other way of speaking had become. See that there in verse 24. And in verses 25 through 27, he uses Solomon as a great example of an individual who essentially adopted the language of the women whom he had married and, and, and bringing in idolatry and doing all that he could to make them happy and not remembering the language of Judah. So, that brings us to the lesson for this morning. Are you still speaking the language of your people? There's the question for this morning. Are you still speaking the language of your people? So let's begin with our first question. Who are your people? Now, of course, we know, since we are here, where we are at, we're talking about Christians, children of God. But I want to, point, I want to make an observation here real quick to you, and then we're going to continue with the sermon. We talked about this this morning in the Bible class a little bit. The children of Israel were a very unique people. They were God's chosen people, going back to Abraham. All the other countries of the world were not. Okay? Keep that in mind. Egypt was not God's chosen people. Ammon was not God's chosen people. The um, uh, Syria and all the other ones were not God's chosen people. Only the nation of Israel were God's chosen people. Now, under the new covenant, which country of the world is classified as God's chosen people? None. None. The only people that are God's chosen people are those who are part of the body of Christ. The royal priesthood, his holy nation. And so now what we begin to realize is like Israel lived in a world of, 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 men, uh, lived in a world of multitude of nations that did not worship God, we as Christians live in a world where no nation is known as a worshiper of God. Okay? I love my country. As far as I'm allowed as a Christian 
to appreciate the country that I live in. But it's not God's country. Only the church is. Only the body of Christ. And so here we are as Christians, and, and I think really a better parallel, and I'll get back to the lesson here in a minute, a better parallel would be when the children of Israel went into the Babylonian captivity. They were no longer a nation of Israelites, if you would. They no longer had land. God had sold them into captivity because of their sin. So here they were, 70 years, strangers in Babylon. And they were told to behave themselves, to respect the government. And one day they would return home. And I think that is probably, if we want to talk types and antitypes, shadows of better things to come, it may be that the captivity is a shadow of what the church is today. That we are God's nation who are not yet at home. That we are strangers in Babylon, in the world, waiting for the day that we will be allowed to go home to paradise, to heaven. Something to think about. Now, let's continue, though. Let's talk about why or who are your people, if you are a Christian. First off, the people of God are made up of those individuals who are part of the body of Christ. Turn with me over to Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. Not everyone in the world is part of the body of Christ. We have to recognize that. Not everyone in the world belongs to this royal priesthood, this holy nation that we're referencing. Romans chapter 12, note with me there in verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church there in Rome, says the following. He says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Notice that. We are many members are one body in Christ. One body in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, notice with me there in verse 27, we see a very similar statement made along the same lines there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there in verse 27, the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So who are your people? Well, if you've answered the gospel's call into salvation, your people are those who are the people of the body of Christ, who are the children of God. Over in Romans chapter 8 for just a moment there. The Apostle Paul again enters to the church at Rome, beginning in verse 15. Romans chapter 8, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. He's not talking about every person in the world. He's talking about those who have obeyed the gospel's call into salvation. But you've received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Then He says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope and cause, the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So who are your people? Your people are those who are of the body of Christ. Your people are those who are the, the children of God, even those who are of the household of God. Paul makes this statement, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He references the household of God. And then in verse 20, which is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Who are your people? Your people. If you are a Christian, a child of God, your people are the body of Christ. Your people are the children of God. Your people are the household of God. And your people are those who are citizens of heaven. Turn with me to Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Turn over to Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 is where we will begin. Paul writes, Brethren, join in following my example to note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. 
whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Listen, when you become a Christian, a child of God, you enter into fellowship with God, you enter into fellowship with Christ, fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and fellowship with every faithful being that has ever lived. Abraham was part of the kingdom of God. The New Testament tells us that. So when we became Christians, we entered into a wonderful fellowship, a wonderful, a citizen, a wonderful family, and entered and became wonderful, uh, part of a wonderful citizenship that resides in heaven. This is who our people are. And here's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter when you were born, where you were born. You can be a part of that wonderful body. It doesn't matter what country you are from. From all over the world, the word of the Lord would flow from Jerusalem to all over the world. People from all, all over the world would come to the word of the Lord, the writing of the prophets tells us. So pick a country, any country in this world, and anybody in that country can become a part of this wonderful body. This is who our people are. So when I say, when I ask the question, are you still speaking the language of your people? Now you know the people that we're talking about. But now let's consider the second question, though. What is the language of God's children? That's the next thing. What is the language of God's children? Well, the first passage that came to mind in, in developing this lesson was the idea of what John wrote about Jesus over in John chapter 1. Let's turn over there for a moment consider the first four verses. John chapter 1. Let's begin there in verse 1. John, in, in, the in the composing of the gospel account, goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice that the Word is used three times in that first verse. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, verse 14, look there. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the language of our people, let's begin with understanding it is the Word. It is the Word that came through Jesus, the Word that came through the Holy Spirit. It is the very wisdom of God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 20-21 talks about the wisdom of God. And how the wisdom of God, even, even if you would, the foolishness of God, is wiser than the wisdom of man. He does a great comparison between the two. And so, if we're talking about the language of God's children, then it's going to be the wisdom of God. When we talk about what is right, what is wrong, when we talk about the goals of our life, when we talk about the meaning of life and the purpose of life, and, and, and so forth and so on, we speak the language of God's wisdom. We speak what is in the Word. We speak what was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told His apostles before He left them, that once he did leave them, he would do something very important for them and for us today as well. Notice beginning in John chapter 16, there in verse 12. John 16, verse 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So, what the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to teach falls under the category of the language of God's children. Falls under the category of the language that we are to be speaking. It is the language of Jesus, the language of the apostles, the language of of the prophets. Ephesians 2 verse 20, the household of God is established upon 
the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, he tells that he has given us apostles and prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers for the work of the church, for the growth, and, and, and for, for the, the, the uh, fulfillment of the work of our Lord and Savior. But notice there, he gave us apostles and prophets. What is the language of God's people? Well, brethren, it is what we find in here. It's what we call the Bible, the Word of God. And that's why Peter, although the context is dealing with something a little bit differently, they're talking about our responsibility in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, that's the language of God's people. Now, I know, when you go to work, if you are a nuclear scientist, then that's what you've got to talk about. If you're a mechanic, you talk about that. If you sell insurance, same thing, you've got to talk about that. But when it comes down to living our life, what is right, what is wrong, what does God desire of us, what is our goal in life, the, 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 what is really the, the true problems, you know, the coronavirus is, is a big issue. But brethren, as we said from the beginning, sin is a worse issue. And people are, are, are looking out through all over the place trying to find the best way of resolving the problem with this virus. That's great. That's wonderful. We need it. But what about the solution to sin? This is the way that we think. All right. This is what we're talking about when we say the language of the people of God. So with that being said, here's the next question. Have we fallen prey to what the people of Judah fell prey to. In other words, have we forgotten our language? Think about that for just a moment. The children of Judah, as we talked about there, over in Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 23 through 27, in that text there, they had allowed themselves to become intermingled with the ungodly people of the nations around them. Okay, We're not talking about simple friendships now. We're talking about becoming so involved with the people around them that began to worship with them. They began to engage in sin with them. They began to, to turn away from their Lord God. That was the problem that happened with Solomon. And he said, even your children have now forgotten the language of Judah. Now, can that happen to us today? Is that possible? Absolutely. Jesus, when he was still on this earth, he foretold the coming of a great apostasy. Paul and Peter talked about these false teachers, talked about deceivers, talked about people turning away from the word of the Lord. Is there a danger of us forgetting the language of our people? The answer is yes. It most certainly is. It's kind of like this. If we think like the world, then we're going to speak like the world. Let me... Let me cover the next point, and then I want to try to stress something here. Over in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 23, this was a passage that we used for our scripture reading. And this is one of the favorite passages among preachers for developing sermons because of what we are about to read here. And it makes sense. Because the dangers that faced Israel, the things that they did, can truly fall upon individuals today. Now, again, I want to stress the difference between the physical nation of Israel and the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ will never fail, okay? The body of Christ will never succumb to false teaching. The body of Christ will never give in to sin. Now, with that said, as individual members of that body, we can. We can leave the fellowship of God. This is where the danger is. We don't have to worry about the church falling. The body of Christ will always stand, just as the Word of God will always stand. But we know the apostasy affects the individual Christians. And so notice what Israel had allowed themselves to do, beginning in Isaiah 5. We'll start there in verse 20. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty in drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. The more you study the writings of the prophets, you begin to realize what brought down the northern nation of Israel and the southern nation of Judah as well. 
And that touched on a lot of it right there. But the biggest thing for the point of the lesson is those who would call evil good and call good evil. When, let's see, who can we pick on here this morning? I pick on Dan. Dan, they had telephones when you were born, right? They, they, they had telephones back then. Um, television, I don't think so, or maybe just, just a, little, a little bit there. Okay. If you were wealthy, you might have one black and white TV. So go way back then. I could pick on Chuck. I think he's a little older, but I won't. Um, so your form of learning things came down to your friends as exposure, the newspaper, and maybe what happened to air on television in the early days. And that was it. Okay? Your friends, bring your family into that as well, and what you read in the newspaper. And that was fundamentally what influenced your life in those early days as a child. For all intents and purposes. Radio. We got radio. Got to remember that too. Lone Ranger was my dad's favorite show when he was a kid. All right. When I was a kid, television galore. Cable was just coming in and settling down on its own. And if your parents had the money, they'd have cable. We didn't. We had antenna. But the radio, even worse. Um, newspapers. Friends, got to bring them in as well, family, those influences. Nowadays, oh, there's so much more. Now it's not just the kids you go to school with or your family members or the neighbors in the neighborhood. Now it's not just what you hear on the radio. But you can sit for hours on end with your electronic device on a number of social media platforms and be inundated all day long. And I'll tell you, when they had to shut down the schools because of this virus, they did no favor for our young people, especially those who were not disciplined enough to do their schoolwork. You go to school, you might be kept away from some of these influences on your phone because they don't let you use phones very much. But at home, here it comes. And back when, when you know, Twitter seemed like a good idea at the time, Facebook seemed like a good idea at the time. And, and I like both platforms for the purpose of sending information out. But man, talk about a time suck and a, and a means of whereby and, and TikTok's another one TikTok you know you can sit down and watch a hundred videos that spew in all sorts of stuff some may be good most of it's bad all in a matter of 30 sec 30 minutes and that's my point we are living in a world that is more inundated with sharing the the, the worldliness that is around us than we have ever had I really believe in the history of the world. Everywhere you turn. It's good stuff. Bad stuff. We've been making use of the internet since we started streaming back in 08. Trying to use it for good things. We are one small percentage of the amount of volume that goes through social media and most of it is not fit for our young people to hear. But they do. And this is where the danger comes in. This is why we have to work so hard to make certain that we don't find ourselves speaking against God's Word. I have known of Christians who would come to a particular viewpoint that effectively stands in opposition to what God's Word say, and then they would say, yeah, but you've got to understand. You can't say these things. You know, right now, I can, I can say that I really believe a godly marriage is a one man, one woman, marriage for life. But at some point, it's going to be a no-no. It's going to offend somebody. And there's a whole other sermon we could do in reference to that. Speaking the philosophy and wisdom of men. Have you ever heard Christians do that? Let's talk about creation and how the world began. Sounds good, great topic. In the beginning, God, now you've got to remember, though, that's more of a metaphor. It didn't really happen that way. We know scientifically it didn't happen, do we? No, we don't. But the more we hear it, and, and, and the social media, the television, the movies, and all the platforms that we have, they are throwing this stuff at us all day long. 
And we wonder why Christians forget the language of their people. We wonder why someone that we knew years ago today is renouncing their belief in God. Someone who would lead singing 20 years ago today is now entering into some sexual immorality. We wonder what happens to people when you intermingle with the philosophy of men and the wisdom of men, you end up finding yourselves calling evil good and good evil, and you end up speaking against the Word of God. What ends up happening, basically, is you answer God's Word with the language of the world. The Bible says this, yeah, I know that, but science and scholars and smart people tell me this. But the Bible says this is wrong. Yeah, you can't really judge people. The Bible says this is wrong. Yeah, but that was culturally back then. The Bible says this is not allowable. Yes, but it is allowable today. God changes if you believe in God. And believe it or not, there have been some people who at one time spoke the language of our people who now no longer can speak the language because they've forgotten it. They've become so inundated with the world and, and the... I'm going to call it the desensitization, if I can say the word right. And that's what happens. We become desensitized. I say we generally, here's the danger, of becoming desensitized to what is wrong because the world makes it sound right. And we begin to think to ourselves, it's not that bad. Some people view things a little bit differently. And I'll, I'll say only this thing because our election, that day is past. But I read a few articles from some evangelicals who basically said uh, abortion should not really be an issue in this election. Well, that's interesting. Abortion is still wrong, and we're against it, but it shouldn't be an issue in choosing who makes the decisions for where we stand on abortion. That's just one small example. So the point that I'm trying to make is very simple. As children of God, you became a Christian because you were taught the language of the, the people of God. And it, and, and it converted you to the truth. You were convicted within your heart to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And, and you made the decision to repent of your sins and be buried with Christ through baptism, rising up to walk in the newness of life, and God adding you to the church, to the family. There was one day when you made this wonderful decision, and now you're supposed to have grown in the knowledge of God's people. But has something happened that has pulled you back into the ways of the world? That's the danger that we're talking about. And so here's the two final questions as we pull the lesson to the close. Look at your life, and I'll look at my life, because we need to be honest about both. Are you speaking the language of God, or are you speaking the language of the world? And that ultimately is where the only two questions we really have to answer. Because if we seek to speak the language of God, the language of the household of God, the language of heaven, if you would, then we'll always take a stance for what is right. We'll recognize what is wrong, and we won't budge, we won't move, we won't give an inch. But if we begin to give an inch, and we begin to budge, and we begin to move, at some point the language of the world will sound better to us, and we'll forget how to speak the language of God. If you're a Christian, let me encourage you to hold fast to the Word of God. There are a lot of ideas that are floating in the world today, and it has always been. Philosophies of men, wisdom of men, Paul talked about it a lot. It's always there. We must make certain that we stay true to what God's Word has told us. We can't budge, we can't move, we can't give an inch. Because if we do, then we'll fall. You know, many times, I'm going to pick on Dan one more time. Dan took his family to the Grand Canyon, wouldn't let him go look over the edge of it. One version of the story. Why not, Dan? Well, they fall off. You fall off. How many times can we get so close to the edge of the way the world thinks, and we're almost to thinking the same thing, and think to ourselves, we won't fall off. 
Study the Word of God daily and hold to it with all your might. If you're not a Christian, I've got some great news for you. While you are lost in sin and you are separated from God, your sins can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. I suspect if you're here, you already believe in God. And I suspect that you do want to do what is right to be faithful to God. But you're waiting to make that last decision of change. And let me encourage you, don't wait any longer. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then let's make the decision to turn away from your sins and obey His command and be baptized so you rise up then to walk in the newness of life. You can be added. God will add you to the body of Christ this morning if you'll do that. But we encourage you to give serious thought to it and learn the language of the people of God and not engage in the language of the world. If you're accepted to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.